Okay, so when we think about who I am, uh, you've already seen the picture of me, which is I'm Lindsay Cormack. I am an author, I'm an associate professor, I'm a mother, um, and I'm active in New York City in our politics and our governance. I'm at Stevens Institute of Technology, which is a STEM-focused engineering university for the most part in Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm on sabbatical right now, and I have been since last May, so I'm like living the happiest, best version of my life that I ever have. I, uh, my first big project that I ever ran was DC Inbox, and I do this for, from uh, 2009 until today. And what that is, is it's an official archive of every email that every member of Congress sends their constituents in their official capacity. On ranked choice voting, I've written a few things um, through my experience and my research in New York City. One of the first things that came out was in the Washington Post with Jack Santucci, someone that um, many of you in this sort of like interest space will know. Um, and that was uh, questioning whether it eliminated spoilers in New York City or not, uh, and some other sorts of promises that we had for ranked choice voting in New York City. I also did some research with Jesse Clark and some colleagues at Princeton looking at how New York City released their cast vote records and how they released their voter roll and how we were able to identify over 300 New Yorkers precise votes because of the insecurity and the way that they did these things. So these are things that I care about. This is the city that I'm in. Um, since that's come out, I've sat down with Board of Elections officials to talk about how we could do this in the future. And one of the driving forces of all the research I do is impact in my own area, things that matter to me. I'm on the Community Board 8 in Manhattan, which is the smallest, most local form of government. It's 51 appointed people in different sorts of parts of uh, Manhattan for me. There's ones in every borough. Uh, and so that's some of the work that I'm doing now. And I've also just finished a book that's coming out in August called How to Raise a Citizen and Why It's Up to You to Do It, which is another labor of love looking at parenting as something that we can use to teach our kids how to engage in politics. Because after years of research and interviewing teachers around the United States, I find that we're not doing it in the schools. And so that's sort of like the pivot. So that's a little bit of who I am. Who I know you to be is I know that you are brave people who show up to Zoom meetings in the middle of the day. I know that you care about elections. I know that you care about talking about these things. I know that you're interested in learning more. I know that you probably have questions of your own. I opened the chat. So if there's any questions you want to put in there, anyone can put them in and then we can get to that at the end. I also know that everyone here probably cares about elections and that we really want our democracy to function better. And so something that I've always found about the ranked choice voting or the electoral form or the approval reform, star, what have you, all of these sort of modifications of how we do things now are done by people who care about our system. And so I'm glad that you're here. I'm grateful that you're here and I'll be excited to hear what you think of this. So in New York City, this is sort of some of the guidance that we got on how you can rank your ballot. And so you can see this is kind of a standard uh, election official documentation that would come out and it would tell people, you know, you're going to have a new ballot. Here's how you do these things. And it would tell you first, second, third, fourth. And when I talk about ranked choice voting today and in all my work, I use the word ranked choice voting. I know there's alternatives like single transferable vote or instant runoff. But for me, ranked choice voting is the phrase. And that's what we also said in New York City. In New York City, we allow up to five selections, uh, and it's only in our party primaries for municipal offices. So any statewide offices will not have ranked choice voting, nor will federal offices. And it's not in the general election, it's only in our party primaries. Uh, the research that I'm gonna show you today is about the mayoral race in New York City, which was the highest uh, form of primary. It was the, uh, the, where it had the most voters, um, the most interest, and so that's sort of the focus of this research. In New York City, we adopted ranked choice voting with a ballot initiative where over 75% of our people said yes, they were into it. And it was first rolled out in our June 2021 primaries. There was very little counter or opposition to ranked choice voting when it was put to voters the first time in New York City. Um, I understand that's not the case in other parts of the country as it's happening right now, but at that time it was true here. In terms of how ranked choice voting worked, the educational piece of telling voters how they're going to encounter this new form of balloting is something that happened by Board of Elections, it happened by individual groups, and it happened by candidates. But I put in parentheses, not much, and I'll show you why, because a lot of candidates didn't think it was their responsibility to talk to people about ranked choice voting. Instead, what they told people is rank me number one. They didn't say like, here's the intricacies. So what you'll see in this next slide 
is let's start on the left. This is another form of guidance that came from the Board of Elections that was saying, here's how you can fill in a ballot. You don't do more than one over for one candidate to say you like them a ton. You don't give more than one candidate the same ranking. So you don't say, you know, I want Eric Adams first and second. And then anything that's, you know, not fully filled in is not going to be something that counts. Standard sort of like how to mark a ballot uh, guidance. Table one here is looking at all the email campaign communications that came from the candidates for the mayoral race. Uh, there are more candidates, but some of them didn't have functioning email outreach in the time that this data was collected. Um, and what you should see here is that most of them did not mention ranked choice voting in the ways that they contacted constituents or contacted potential voters in their e-newsletters or in their, in their campaign newsletters. And when they did, they oftentimes were not describing, here's how it works. Here's an example from Eric Adams, where it's saying, you know, we're getting ready to go to the polls, we have 24 hours left. And then you'll see in that highlighted part, it says, you know, here's how you're gonna do it, apart from ranking Eric number one on your ballot. And that's pretty much the line that most of the campaigns took. And I think there's good reason for that in that in nearly every election, ranked choice or not, whoever wins in the first round is the winner. In any sort of like high stakes elections, the advisors who are advising these campaigns know that they'd rather win in the first round and they don't really want to give name recognition to anyone else. And that was sort of what I was hearing in the campaign class of people at the time. And so they were saying, just tell us your name. Don't say anyone else's name because you risk muddying the waters for voters. You, miss, you risk confusing them or having them think about someone else. So the question that I came at this election with was, if we have more choices in the way that we're selecting our candidates, do we also have more problems? And it has some very simple intuitions. Making more choices is harder than making one choice. If you're faced with five people and you have to pick your favorite, that's far easier than saying, oh, I need to learn a little bit about everyone and have some sort of ranking. So making more choices is simply harder. Ordering is harder as well. Like I just said, you have to say, you know, who's above who or below the other. Strategy is hard as well. If you know a lot about ranked choice voting and you think you want to be strategic, you're going to rank to block or you're going to rank to have some sort of strategic transfer in the second round or third round, that's even harder. So it's just levels of magnitude more difficult than saying this is my favorite. Though ranked choice voting is harder in the fact that you're making more choices is harder, previous research that we have says people eventually do understand this and difficulties that people have the first time around can fade with practice. Something that gives me pause in the New York City context is that this is not the practice that we have generally. Nearly every election we've had since has just been a standard single choice ballot. And so we have to like this whiplash where it's like, OK, in the party primaries, this is how we do it, but not in any other elections. And then every two, if it's a census year, every four years, otherwise we come back to this ranked choice voting. So voters will understand this potentially. But in New York City, it's been a bit strange. The second sort of motivating intuition that I had is that voters come to the ballot box with different levels of political interests and know-how. And this is true no matter what sort of electoral system you have. You know, different people have different amounts of capacity and time to spend caring about politics, thinking about who's their favorite, ballot initiatives, all these things. We have different levels of how much we want to care and then different capacities of how much we can care based on all the other stressors that we're going to have in our day-to-day -day life on what we're deciding. What previous research has found, um, mostly in the California context, is that non-white, non-native English speakers and those who have less means about them are more likely to express difficulty in understanding ranked choice voting, and they are more likely to have their ballots voided. Um, this is research that is mostly done in California, but my worry at the time was like, oh no, this could be happening in New York City too. And one of the reasons I thought it would happen in New York City is because I sort of like understand our context, and I'll get into that in a minute. But there's a few different things that can go wrong with more choices. Increased complexity could lead to undervoting. So it could be people saying, you know what? I can only figure out so many things. I only like so many candidates. So I'll maybe give one or two rankings, which would be considered an undervote when you have so many candidates and you can put five. Or overvoting, which is like, if you're confused by the system, you might say like Eric Adams, Maya Wiley, Eric Adams again. And those sorts of overvoting confusions or the ones that like you don't quite know how the ballot's working, that is the thing that was most concerning to me. The reason that I think overvoting is probably worse than undervoting is undervoting sort of like turns down the volume on someone's choices. Like you could have five choices, but you only express two, three, or four. And so your choice is still out there. But what overvoting does is it totally mutes your input because an overvoting voting voids the ballot 
for that election. Now, to be clear, if you overvote accidentally for mayor, but you don't for city council, they don't throw out your whole ballot, but they do not count what you're going to vote for for mayor because the overvote says, I'm sorry, this person didn't understand how this system works. They're not using the ballot correctly. That's going to be a voided ballot right there. The way that New York City does this is we void over ballots in many, but not in every instance. So one sort of example that people point to is like, what if you just voted for the same candidate five times through? Like, you're just like, I want to put all my choices towards them if you really didn't understand how the ballot worked. That is not something that's thrown out in the New York City system. However, on this question, and this is something that was troublesome the whole time of our rollout, people who were in charge of the operation were not clear on that particular point. This is going to be sort of messy, but I'll show you some screenshots from uh, prior to the election rolling out. There were a bunch of groups that were saying, we're going to teach people how to talk to voters about how ranked choice voting works. And so this is um, a council member who's giving part of the discussion. And this is kind of a, in a, a format where she's saying, here's why ranked choice voting works for us. And this is me asking questions in the Q&A box. And so I ask, were the ballots that had the same person listed five times voided in the NYC primaries? Straightforward question. And what I get from the executive director of the group hosting this is, yes. I say thanks. That's confusing with the cast vote record ballot data released by the Board of Elections because in the cast vote ballot records released by the Board of Elections, if someone did vote for Eric Adams five times through, it would say Eric Adams, Eric Adams, Eric Adams, Eric Adams, Eric Adams. However, if they were to make that mistake, like Eric Adams, Maya Wiley, it would say overvote if they came back to Eric Adams. And so that's not quite what it looked like. I ended up continuing this discussion with the Board of Elections and the interpretation that I had, the sense that I had originally is correct. You don't void something if it just says the same person five times through. It's that coming back to the person that's voiding. But this was unclear. Another thing that caused me concern moving up to this is in New York City, we have a lot of different languages that are spoken and there was not an agreed upon translation of what ranked choice voting was going to be in all of the languages. So if you had voters coming to the ballot for the first time or coming to the polls for the first time, they would have encountered a system that is already sort of like difficult in the sense that it's maybe not in their native language. But even when we have translators, describing what this change is is not as straightforward as it might be to you or I or to people who are really enmeshed in this system. So thinking about, you know, how you have a term of art that's translated into a different language was challenging and it's not something that we did very well in New York City. So one of the reasons that I thought New York City might see some of the lessons that we learned in California is that we are an especially residentially segregated city. What you're seeing at the top are borough-wide statistics because in New York, we have five main boroughs that sort of make up where everyone lives. And the first column is telling you the percent or the number of assembly districts. So what we have in terms of how we break out uh, individual voters is they have assembly districts is sort of this big aggregation. And then election district is a smaller aggregation and then voters. At the level of assembly district, we also collect census data. And so that's sort of the level of aggregation that this analysis has to happen at. So you'll see that it's spread out. Um, different parts have different numbers of assembly district, which is based on population. You'll see that the median household income really varies as well. We come from a, a low in the Bronx of 41,000, a high in Manhattan of 90,000. The shares of people with a Bachelor of Arts degree, which is that fourth column there, um, they also vary as well, where we, again, we see a low in the Bronx and a high in Manhattan. And then you'll see the four following col columns are all about the sort of racial segregation or, or diversity or, or differences that we have across the boroughs in New York City. There's just a lot of variety here. So the expectations that I had in specific were that on uh, measures of education, ballot voidable overvoting would be more likely to happen in areas where we had lower levels of education on average. That's sort of like how I came at it. I also thought income would matter because income is sort of this proxy for all these other things, like your ability to be informed about politics, your ability to have politicians even come through your neighborhood and talk to you about these things. It's all related to the income of an area. And so a similar expectation in areas where incomes were lower on average, there would be greater rates of ballot voiding over votes. And so the question that I ask is, were ranked choice voting ballots voided at greater rates in places with lower educational, educational attainment and incomes in 2021? And in order to see that sort of contrast, I contextualize it against the elections that we had in 2017 and 2013, which, which are two prior mayoral elections, because we know ballot voiding happens in every election. And so the question is, is it different under ranked choice voting in ways that are related to race, to education, to income that we can kind of see? 
So what you're seeing here is just two sorts of districts to show you how different these assembly districts can be in New York City. On the left is Assembly District 73, which is parts of the Upper East Side, where the median annual income is 144,000. And I have all the other you know, statistics on the differences between these two communities, but I'm only showing you income because it is a proxy for so many other things. And in contrast, you have Assembly District 84, which is right across the river in the South Bronx, uh, where the average income is 26,000. These are people who are living wildly different lives and have access to many different things in terms of educational uh, out outreach from campaigns and in any sort of like attention on politics. It is just different because we live in a, a very differentiated city. So the data that I used for this was the Democratic primaries mayoral race. And I have the cast vote record, as anyone can have the cast vote record. It's up on the Board of Elections for New York City with individual voiding errors, which is also listed on all of these. In 2017, what I used is the Democratic primary. And at that level, they aggregate how many ballots are tossed at the assembly district. So that's like the force of like why we have to be at the assembly district. You can figure it out at the individual level at the cast vote record for 2021. You can't one-to-one -one match every voter to how much money they're making, but you can see what assembly district they cast their ballot in. And so that's why I had to do the aggregation at the 2021 uh, data. 2013 is the same thing where it's the general election for mayor because that's the first election that the Board of Elections put all of this data online. And again, here it's the assembly district aggregation. Daniel, I see your hand and I will get to you as soon as we're done with this. So assembly district is also, like I said, where we aggregate census data. And so, you know, you can have data on all sorts of things. And for the things that I care about here, it's sort of the racial makeup of a place, the income of a place and the average educational attainment of a place. And to do the start of this analysis, it was just a simple correlation. And the tables of those is what I'm going to show you, or the, the graphs of those is what I'm going to show you today, because I think it's the easiest way to sort of understand this data. So let's spend a little bit of time right here. What you're seeing is on the x-axis, we've got the share of bachelor's degrees. So that's the amount of a individual population that has a bachelor's degree. Um, it ranges from zero to 100 theoretically, but this is on average where it is. And then on the other axes, you'll see the share of ba ballots that were voided because of overvoting. I've colored the different boroughs. So the Bronx is red, Brooklyn is yellow, Queens is green, Staten Island is blue, and Manhattan is black, just so you can see these things a little bit easier. But for people who are, you know, like if you if you understand the area, if you've been around here, this picture is pretty stark. It shows you that in places that are already on the margins of political power in terms of how much they can influence by donations, their ballots were voided at much greater rates than they were in other areas where there are higher levels of education on average. Now, this next piece is the same analysis, but using that 2017 and 2013 election. So you'll notice the dates on the bottom here are 2016 and 2012, because that's the census data that was used in order to get to that aggregation. Uh, and what you'll also notice is that things are spread out in really strange ways. Now, there's something obviously going on in some Brooklyn parts in 2012 or in, 20, in the 2013 election where they're having a lot of ballots voided. And that's like a separate question for a separate analysis. But you do not see the relationship that we saw in ranked choice voting where it was very clear that there's something that's happening along educational attainment that seems to be related to the likelihood that someone's ballot is voided for overvoting. This is the same sort of picture, except for right now, we're only looking at median annual income. So same setup, same sort of question. How likely is it that someone's ballot was voided relative to their average annual income in their assembly district area? Well, it's much higher in the Bronx than it is in Manhattan. Annual incomes are also much lower in the Bronx than they are in Manhattan. And you can see that sort of curve. Now, this is a good place to kind of stop and sort of flag for everyone. Everyone's like, what about ecological inference? What, you know, you're not looking at individual voter data. You're looking at big assembly district aggregation. And I understand this problem very well. However, that's not truly a concern for this sort of analysis because it would be a problem if we thought there was some sort of other mechanism that was saying like, oh, only the least educated people were voting in one area and the most educated people were voting in the other area, or there was something about how only the poorest people vote here and the richest people vote here. That's not what we would expect to happen. We expect the mechanism for people to turn out to be kind of similar everywhere. It's like people who care about these things on average within their own sort of context, they tend to be the people who are better, um, better educated and more well off. Not universally true, but there's not a counter mechanism that would work to make this sort of ecological inference problem something to really concern the analysis here. 
what you're seeing here is that same look in the 2017 and 2013, but just by income here. And you'll see, again, it's scattered. Again, something was happening in Brooklyn in terms of the amounts of ballots that were getting voided, uh, but it's different. It's not the same. It's more spread out and it doesn't seem as highly related to income or education as it does in the ranked choice elections. Another piece that was interesting here is if we look at whose ballots were more likely voided for overvoting, we know that it happened more in the Bronx than anywhere else, but on average, absentee ballots were far more problematic. And this is because in New York City, the way that we do our balloting is you fill out the bubbles and by your hand, and then it head goes into like a Scantron machine. And if there's an error, it'll kick it back out and say like, ah, there's an error in how you've done this. And so people have this automatic uh, sort of like component of like, oh, I can fix this right now. In terms of if you've mailed in an absentee ballot that makes an error, there's meant to be an effort to tell the person by mail, there's an error in your ballot. You have a curing period where you can go fix this. But what this sort of data says to me is that curing didn't happen that often. And it seems to me like there's errors that could have been made that would have been worse had we not had Scantron sort of kickbacks automatically that said your ballot's been filled out incorrectly. So we see the same sorts of patterns of people whose ballots get rejected for overvoting um, and cross the boroughs, but we see that it's different depending on the mode that they chose to vote where email or where mailing in your vote was related to more likelihood that your overvote as an absentee ballot was voided and not cured. And we didn't see that in, as much in terms of how we saw overvoided, overvoted, voided ballots in in-person voting. So what can be done about this? Which is like the question that I always come back to because I want our city to feel as good as it can. I want people to understand their processes. I want people to have elections that make them feel good. I want them to have outcomes that they get, even though I know everyone can't get everything that they want. At the top line, I do think it's important that any reform that's a voting reform that makes it harder for communities that are already marginal in politics to participate demands that we have extra scrutiny or remedy. And that's something that I find to be often lacking in the electoral reform sort of a movement generally is we are at, you know, sort of this place of trying to make our politics feel better and function better. But we have to grapple with these hard questions, which is, do we want to make it harder for people to participate in politics? Maybe. But if so, we owe it to everyone to say that we're going to have educational rollouts on these things. And any sort of change in our system does demand scrutiny. It doesn't mean any change is bad, but it does mean that we have, a, we have an obligation to sort of look at these things so that we don't further marginalize people who are already at the margins of politics generally. Second is I think research and academia has to invest more in studying ballot reform impacts. Uh, I go to nearly all of our major conferences and there is always only one or two panels that will talk about electoral reform because most of the work that happens on this is happening outside of academia. It's happening in sort of like the policy entrepreneur space. And so it is a call that I've repeated to many of my colleagues is that we need to have more people who are focused on this from an academic lens, people who you know don't have anything to lose or gain by having their reforms adopted or not, but just sort of want to figure out what we're doing Doing so that we have a better sense of how we can have better elections. For cities and advocates, I think it is something where ranked choice voting seems like there's so many pros to this. Everyone gets to be more expressive. Perhaps you get to candidates that are better. You're going to have more people run, all these things. We can also acknowledge that there are costs and downsides and cons to adopting ranked choice voting. And it doesn't have to be you're either for it or against it in every way, but we owe it to figure out what these costs are. And then we can confront them as more places uh, consider it. In terms of what I would say to cities, board of elections and campaigns, we have to do educational efforts. And if we know this, like now that the city of New York knows that there was a problem that was greater in the Bronx and parts of Brooklyn and parts of Queens than it was in Manhattan, we owe it to the voters and the residents of those areas to do more on the educational rollout so their ballots are not voided at higher rates. Anything less is an unfair and unjust way of covering our eyes to a problem that we already know that the data exists and speaks to. And finally, I think for people who are voting reform activists or cities who are trying to figure out other ways to bring reforms, there are alternative expressive methods that have lower voiding error risks. Approval voting is one of those because if you have approval voting, there's not a, an ordering challenge or an ordering question really that comes in. It's like, is this person marked or not? And so if you want to have some more expressive forms of government, but you're afraid that you don't want to adopt something that's going to maybe accidentally mute people's inputs by voiding their ballots, approval voting is something that people should consider instead of just writing off as like, oh, it's this other alternative. That is 
that's it for me. And so if you ever have questions, I think Mike's going to lead us through like a little Q&A now. Um, but if there's something that we don't get to, like I said, I'm on sabbatical. I have more time than I ever have. You're welcome to send me emails on this. And then this QR code is also for, I think, the Instagram that I'm doing right now, which is not my favorite thing, but is a thing in my life. Mike, <laughs> that's it. We can do questions, however you want to manage this next part. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so I want folks to use the Q&A uh, feature uh, with, um, uh, with the Google Hang here. So if you see in the lower right-hand corner, there is uh, uh, activities. If you click on that, then you should uh, have an opportunity to submit a question. And I will uh, relay that to Lindsay before we go to those you did a really good job summarizing your findings uh, at the end there but is there uh, if if you could boil it down to one or two things that you really want people to get out of uh of this um paper and this presentation what would it what would it be i think it truly is that more choices are not always better, that there are problems that come about with more choices. It makes it somewhat harder for people to participate in the elections, just mentally from the cognitive task of having to ordinarily rank a bunch of people. But there's also the true real politic downside of having people's ballots voided. When they came out, they tried to participate, they tried a new system, but they just didn't understand it. And so their ballots get voided. That's that's a true problem that I think we should confront. So those are the pieces that matter the most to me. And was you could one could infer from the data of the assembly districts uh, that that there that there may have been uh, an issue with with uh, racial demographics. I noticed that you didn't bring that into it. Was it, uh, was was there any uh, data on that? So in the paper, um, there's the the regressions that have their racial controls as well. It actually works sort of interestingly because there's just so much collinearity in terms of uh, educational attainment and income uh, and racial makeup of an area that it's really hard to tease out those areas. Now, if I were to just show you um, a graph that was like, what's the percentage of your population that is either black or Hispanic, you would see very similar curves to what I was showing you there, um, but I didn't put them in these presentations. Got it. Perfect. Uh, so we've got some questions now. Um, so this is from John. It says, you mentioned uh, that you studied whether ranked choice voting allows spoilers. What did you find? Yeah. So the answer is yes. And sometimes it's not in the sort of way that we think of for traditional elections. Sometimes um, something that Jack and I have kind of talked about is like a circular firing squad spoiler where you have, um, you know, you're in a Democratic primary or a Republican primary. So it's just a bunch of internal people who are like all playing spoiler to each other in this sort of merry-go-round of it instead of like, oh, it was going to be these two. And then this one person took away the votes. The math of it just becomes bigger because the field is bigger. But the idea that spoilers don't exist in these elections isn't really true. Um, I think there's some context that matters there. We don't have a system where you have to have like a runoff election if no one gets over 50% of the vote. In those areas, ranked choice voting does a little bit of a different thing, but that's not really the, the background that we were coming from. And so, yes, it still allows for spoilers, similar to the traditional ways, but it also opens up different types of spoiling. Right, when we've seen the different types of spoiling in uh, Alaska and Burlington and a couple other... Uh, yeah, so places. like in Alaska, you know, there's the arguments that like Palin, Palin supporting voters would have done better to not have come out at all because they would have got the outcome of Begich instead of Peltola. So yeah, there's there's still sort of spoilers. And in the New York context, we, we had many more candidates on average. Uh, it went from races where we used to have three to four candidates to our norms were five to eight candidates in our city council races. Uh, and so we just had an explosion of candidates that happened in New York City. Interesting. Okay, another, this is an anonymous question. Um, it said, in comparing uh, 2013, 2017, and 2021, how did you control the competitiveness of the race slash size of the field? Yeah, this is a great question. So um, something that is important to remember is that it is the same race that's happening everywhere. So in each one of those assembly districts, it's the same race. It's all a mayoral race. Um, and in terms of how they look differently, 
Uh, the 2013 is a, there's no incumbents. Everyone is new. And that's when we get Bill de Blasio the first time around. And then the 2017 is a re-election campaign. So that's different, obviously. Uh, but then when we have our 2021 campaign, that's a totally clean slate as well. So that's like kind of the, the best analog to 2013 because it was all new candidates, no incumbents. Um, and in terms of the competitiveness, like was the competitiveness of 2021 greater or less than 2017 or 2013. Again, it's a really hard question because we had way more candidates in 2021. Uh, and so that's, there's not a control for that, but it's not something that should affect, you know, like it's just as competitive as it in the Bronx as it is, is in Manhattan because it's the same contestants for a citywide office. That wouldn't be true if I was showing you data on city council races, because those, the, you know, those do have variances in terms of who's running and the competitiveness and all that sorts of thing. But it is a good question. Great. Uh, and then we have another one here that says, uh, would counting the ranked choice ballots with Condorcet rules rather than instant runoff rules reduce the burden of educating voters uh, and the need to throw out over votes? Yeah, so this is like an in the weeds question. Uh, the answer is is maybe. Uh, I don't know that it actually would change the need to throw out over votes because a lot of that is not really decided in terms of how how functional can we make our elections. That's like legalese that happens at the Board of Elections. And so that would be something where we'd have to go back and like amend our policy that says if a ballot is marked this way or that way, it gets thrown out or not. The education piece, sure, there might be an argument there, but in terms of does it change the likelihood that people's ballot gets thrown out, we could say we're going to do it that way, but it would actually take a policy change to make it so that these sorts of ballots weren't or weren't, were or were not voided. So it's a little bit harder there. Okay. Hey, are you okay to keep going? Uh, so, so we've got we've got several. The the uh, questions are coming hard and fast. Uh, did did each party uh, have its own uh, RCV or were all candidates lumped together uh, like the Alaska congressional race uh, a few years ago? In New York City, we have closed primaries. So the Republicans are only competing against Republicans and the Democrats are only competing against Democrats and only registered members of those parties can participate. So it's, it's very different from the Alaskan version of, of this. And do you prefer RCV by party or uh, or otherwise? I don't. I don't think I have a strong preference on <laughs> on that. Fair I think enough. there's enough problem. I mean, there's enough challenges on closed versus open primary systems. But yeah, I don't. I don't have a strong preference there. Understood. Uh, what other elections do you uh, do you know that where researchers have looked uh, at spoiled ballot rates? Uh, are the Minnesota uh, and Oakland studies similar? I can't speak to the specifics of the Minnesota. Um, Oakland and California, California generally, of the few cities that have tried it, they're, they're, the spoil rates are probably similar to New York City, but I would be hesitant to say that because I haven't done that work precisely. I've uh, convened with the authors to say, like, are we on the same track? And the answer is yes, but I don't know the, the numbers that are comparable. I also know that there's some research in North Carolina that looks at similar sorts of things and they had challenges as well. Mike, I am gonna shift up because I see that there are two questions we skipped and maybe we skipped yep. them because you wanted to or maybe we skipped them because they just got skipped. <laughs> uh, go ahead. So I see one that says, thanks a lot. To what extent do you think the results from ranked choice voting in New York City will persist in future elections or do you expect voters will learn from previous experiences to reduce? Yeah, so I, I do think voters will learn to uh, correct these errors. I do think over time we will see that. I think it is hard in New York City because it doesn't happen in every election and, and it actually only happens every four years or every two years depending on different sorts of things. It's it's like, it's very idiosyncratic. You're never gonna have this on a general election. You're never gonna have this in a state or a federal election, I don't think in New York City. Um, so we might learn it, but it's gonna be hard. I don't think, and this is something that I like very truly believe, no one at the mayoral race in New York City is ever going to campaign and win by saying, if not me, pick this other candidate. Because no one in the consulting class tells people, make sure you say someone else's name. So I think there are parts of ranked choice voting in like the like, we're gonna make a more accommodable politics that can make sense for lower offices, maybe for unpaid offices, for some like smaller things. But because 
all the municipal offices in New York City, even city council, are so high stakes. You know, it's a, it's it's a it's the one of the most professionalized legislatures that there is at the city level. I don't think we're going to see that in New York City. So if the learning happens, it's going to come from groups. It's not going to come from candidates because candidates don't feel that it's in their interest to educate voters on how to use the ranking system. They want to ask you to vote for them first because they know on average in ranked choice voting elections, like 90% upwards, whoever wins in the first round is the winner. And they'd rather keep saying their name versus anyone else. So those education pieces are not gonna come from candidates. It'll have to come from groups. Okay, well, and then I see one of the major issues with uh, IRV RCV is the center squeeze effect. Do we have any information on that? Uh, that's not really a question that I looked at here. I think, I know that there are other people who are, are doing that sort of work. In terms of stuff that I could give you sort of insights to, what we, what we sort of found on the city council races is, what happened in the New York City Democratic primary was sort of a moderating of who ended up winning. So it wasn't like the leftist most candidates who in other years might have eked out some sort of victory. We got sort of like a, a moderating, which is, is not quite the center squeeze effect, but that's sort of the only thing that I can speak to in the New York City elections that I that I know of that I experienced here. Okay. Okay. And on the, on, no, back to yeah, on the on the bottom here, you have uh, you said that more choices are always harder. Aren't more choices sometimes easier uh, as under approval voting? Uh, if a voter doesn't have a clear choice or his or her first choice uh, is a fringe candidate, so so the voter wants to vote for more uh, for more viable uh, other choices. So essentially, I guess the question is, um, you know, isn't isn't approval voting easier uh, for voters? So first, I want to say thank you to Steve Brams for asking the question. And for anyone who's on the call and doesn't know who this guy is, you should just go Google him because then you'll figure out that he knows more about this than everyone here. Um, Steve, I also should tell you that Maxwell Stearns wanted to say hello to you. But on the question, um, more choices always being harder or not, I, I would push on this. Uh, I think about it as if I like go to a, a restaurant. So if I go to a restaurant and there's three choices, it's like restaurant week or something, and I get to pick, you know, uh, one appetizer out of three, one entree out of three, and one dessert out of three, that's sort of easier. Um, it might not be, you know, everything that I want, but I can pick it. If I go to a diner and I have like a pamphlet and it's like there's 12 pages of all the different things that they can give to me, I might get something that I want a lot more. But it is sort of harder in the sense that like you have to like know more things and evaluate more things. I think approval voting in terms of the choices that are offered versus traditional voting or ranked choice voting is that middle piece. I think we know that if we had approval voting, we'd have more candidates in the same way that we have more candidates under ranked choice voting. Uh, but it doesn't mean that it's like harder or easier. It means that the impact would be maybe not as much because let's say it's still harder. You have 10 choices versus picking from three choices. You have to learn a little bit more. You have to like figure out if you're going to like people or not, but you might sort of set this internal thing that says, you know what, I'm going to see the people who say they're going to support X. I support X. That's enough. I figure it out. So it might reduce the overall cost of figuring out who you're going to support, but it still is more than picking out who your favorite is when the candidate pool is smaller under traditional elections, which it generally is. So it's not so much a question of the system. It's like what the candidate pool looks like. Approval voting does seem far easier to me than ranked choice voting because you have this sort of internal bright line of like, can I support this person, approve this person, yes, no. Whereas with ranked choice voting, you have to say, who do I prefer first, second, third? What do I think the rest of the electorate's gonna do? Is there gonna be any transference? And so it's a it's a very fine question, but I think it's like kind of yes and kind of no. Yeah, we, we had uh, ranked choice in Arlington, Virginia, where I live and there was, uh, a lot of struggling with uh, on the county board being able to uh, really adequately rank uh, choices that people didn't know anything about. And so that's a perfect situation where I think approval voting is much more effective. Rob, if, uh, I see you have your hand up. Can you uh, add your question to the uh, Q&A for me? Okay, we got a new question that just came in. Um, if I may build on Bram's question, the phrasing more choices may be misleading. If I provide a ranking, it could be considered as one choice varying based on the amount of information provided. Nonetheless, 
uh, the design uh, through which preferences are elected could be either in, intuitive or demanding. Simone, I'm going to have to admit that I don't quite follow. Maybe you can do a, a clarification. Um, what what I what I mean in the phrasing of more choices, more problems, is that the typical way that a voter has to encounter their choice of who they're going to select is they have to make one choice. They have to say, I'm going to pick this person. The end, done. What ranked choice voting says, uh, and maybe this is what you're kind of saying, you know, it's one choice, but it's along a continuum says, you know, I might try to optimize for, let's just say something silly, like I want to get the youngest candidate in. And so you pick the one who's 30 and then the 35 and then the 37 and then the 40 and the 80 year old. You could do something like that and say, you know, that's just one choice. I'm just optimizing over this thing. I don't think that's the choice that most people have. I think they're actually having to do sort of like uh, a bigger matrix math calculation in their head of like what matters to them. Um, and then I do agree that the design could be uh, the design through which preferences are elicited. Maybe you mean eliminated. I don't know. Could be either intuitive or demanding. That's something where maybe we could talk more on that because I don't quite think I know what you mean by that. Uh, John uh, asks, if you're saying 90 percent of the time that the RCB winner is the first round winner, how much of a reform is ranked choice over plurality? I agree with that question. I think that's something that we have to confront. I, yes. That yeah, uh, on average, that's that's what happens. Um, and I think if you get in with people who are consulting or running campaigns for any sort of higher stakes thing, they know this, and they are operating under. They don't really change their operating assumptions. They just know that this is going to be win in your first round. That's how you win. And so yeah, I agree. There's a question of how much of a reform it is. And then uh, Eric asks, couldn't approval voting be even easier than plurality voting because someone may be torn between more than one candidate uh, that they like? Sure, like it could. And I think that maybe this um, this is maybe where some of these questions are coming from. Let's say you had like, you know, you have preferences where you're like, oh, I really like both these people. I don't have to like fight it out in my head. I can just like pick them. Sure, that's fine. That's sort of like this second order question. The first thing is, oh my God, I have an array of 10 candidates. I have to go figure that out. Now, remember, we do this in our municipal primaries, which we have a lot of offices. We have like, you have a mayor where there's 14 people running. We have the DA where there's 10. We have um, the um, public advocate. We have city council races. We have the comptroller. And so it's just that we're adding in so many more things. And this is not to say ranked choice voting is the only reason why our candidate lists ballooned in 2021. We also have a very generous matching program where many more candidates were able to qualify for the matching funds. And so there's a lot of other things that are at play in the New York City uh, in, uh, adoption of ranked choice voting. But on average, it is true that when you have ranked choice voting, you have more candidates that get in at least in the first few elections before people sort of wise up and figure out that it's mostly a plurality race. But but none of our m adoptions that have happened in the last 20 years have shown otherwise. It's that more people get in versus fewer. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for uh, for taking the time to answer all those questions. Um, I do want to to uh, raise up what Brandy just put in the chat. We we are always looking for ways to uh, improve our events. I apologize for the technical difficulties at the beginning, um, but uh, we would love for you to fill out the survey that's that's in there and, and give us some feedback. Um, well, we may have gotten one final question. Do you have time for one more question? I'm here. Okay, awesome. Uh, it says, Lindsay, I'm a local elected official, and I want to uh, want to be more like you. What? That's kind of weird. Uh, um, <laughs> okay. Well, somebody just was saying they want to be more like you, so that's uh, so that's great. Well, I'm um, glad you can see this because I can't see the questions anymore, and I don't know why. But huh, interesting. Um, well, so as uh, as the screen shows, uh, Lindsay's included her email and uh, the QR code. Uh, before you go, tell us a little bit about uh, DC Inbox and uh, and some of the research you're doing uh, on that. Sure. So, you know, DC Inbox is one of my favorite projects. It's my like baby project of um, when I was in graduate school, which is this is it now. I think you can see it on the screen. Um, let's see if we do ranked choice voting. I don't know how many people will talk about that in 
uh, official e-newsletters. But what this is, is great. Okay, so Democrats are talking about it more than Republicans. That's kind of interesting. Um, we can look at how people have been doing this over time. Oh, I'm clicking the wrong thing. Um, and I imagine it's all going to be sort of in the more recent period. So what you see here is how many official e-newsletter. Yeah, this, this database spans from 2009 until today. Most of the focus is happening here. Um, it just has every message that every member of Congress has sent to their constituents in their official capacity. So it's, um, you know, it's it's my project that I think I wish a government organization would have taken on a long time ago. I wish they would have said, ah, it matters for us to record what taxpayer funded communications talk about. Um, and so here I'm showing you through, you can click through and you can see sort of like the ways that they're talking about different things and you can see their official e-newsletters. Um, it has been one of the most fun things for me to do. It's something that I started at NYU and I continue to this day. And the New York Times just ran a piece talking about how members of the Republican Party are oftentimes falling back on sort of anti-Semitic tropes, even while they are decrying anti-Semitism on campuses. And we wouldn't know that if not for DC Inbox, because they go and look and they say like, what is it that the people are saying? Uh, and so that's that's something that I, I'm very proud of and I love this project a lot. That's very, very cool. Um, and I, uh, not to not to give your book a plug, but I just bought it. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, to reading that because I've got a 10 month old that uh, I need to teach how to be a citizen. So, um, uh, but I wanna thank you again on behalf of CES and everybody for, for taking time. Um, please do uh, uh, reach out to Lindsay. If you have more questions, reach out to me. Um, I'm going to send out another link to the survey as well. I really want people's feedback. Again, I apologize about the uh, um, technical difficulties at the beginning, but uh, and thank you all for your questions as well. I think the, the uh, Q&A was great. So um, with that, I think we'll, uh, we'll close it down. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for having me, Mike. And thanks everyone for asking the questions and being here. It's really something to come out on a Thursday to learn a little bit about ranked choice voting. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.